Hi, it's great to be able to join Current Archaeology Live. And I want to start off by thanking everybody on the Current Archaeology theme. And thank you especially to Carly and all the work that she's done organizing this year. Um, I am Ayushi Nayak. I'm a doctoral researcher at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History. And I will be talking today about urban palimpsests in Indus Valley cities. So I'll be talking about stable isotope analysis and how I use this method to understand social differentiation in these cities. So when we consider South Asia as a whole, the chronology and nature of agricultural societies in South Asia is impressively diverse. Different crops in different parts, and eventually there's a move to heavy, broad range double cropping throughout the year. And this happens around 400 to 200 BC. Um, Today, I'll mainly be focusing on the area that's labeled B in this map, uh, and that is the Indus Valley Civilization. And I will be primarily focusing on large cities within the Indus Valley Civilization. So for a quick background to the Indus Civilization, uh, it spans roughly from about 3300 BCE to about 1300 BCE. And the Indus civilization spreads across much of Northwest and Northern South Asia. So this is large parts of Pakistan and parts of Northern and Western India. And initially these sites were excavated uh, around the Indus Valley. So the first sites that were excavated were Mohenjo-daro and Harappa, which you can see here, uh, labeled on both these maps. Both these sites are in modern day Pakistan. And initially, these sites led archeologists to assume that the Indus civilization was just along the Indus River and its tributaries. Subsequent research has revealed a vast network of cities, towns, villages, and these focus around major river basins within this crescent-shaped area that you can see shaded in the second map on the right. And because of these initial excavations at the large cities of Mohenjo-daro and Harappa, Initially, the Indus civilization was characterized as having big, enormous, well-planned cities. And these early excavations were carried out during colonial rule in South Asia. And these excavations were done by British colonial officers as well as local archeologists. But the view about what the Indus civilization was about how to interpret what was being excavated was very much determined by this colonial lens and by European ideas of ancient civilizations from other parts of the world that had also been excavated during the colonial time period. And excavations in the late 20th century and in more recent times have definitely confirmed these massive cities with detailed urban planning, with public water resources, with centralized food storage and drainage systems. And we have seen these at other major cities, such as at the sites of Dholavira, Lothal and Kalibangan. Uh, all three of these are in modern day India. And these have revealed vast structures and planned streets in a grid-like system. These have revealed drainage systems and public baths, public toilets. So it's planning at a completely massive scale. 
The other thing that we see within the civilization is a multiplicity of materialities. And by this, I mean that lots of different kinds of resources are being exploited and the even individual resources are being used in lots of different ways. So some are used in a sort of everyday sense in terms of uh, the pottery that they might have used to eat off of, but also the same terracotta is also used to, for example, construct objects that might be considered special or sacred or conspicuous. Um, and of course, this is our lens and how we interpret these items. Um, but a few of these examples are, for example, um, on the left here, you can see an image of what is called the priest king of Mohenjo-daro. Um, this small statuette uh, made of soapstone has widely been interpreted as an, an image of uh, someone important, whether this was a priest, whether this was a king. Of course, we don't really know, but the way that the decoration, the jewelry that he's wearing, the way that um, his hair and his uh, facial hair has been um, represented is very specific. And this is certainly one of the most um, carefully constructed items that has been recovered from the Indus civilization. We also have this beautiful um, quote unquote dancing girl, which was also recovered from Mohenjo-daro. Um, and you can see that the statue is constructed from prawns. There is lots of jewelry on her. She's holding something in her hands. Um, and again, you can really see the craftsmanship that it takes to create something like this um, and something that isn't part of the everyday life. And lastly, on the right here, you can see, again, the famous uh, quote unquote unicorn of Harappa. And this is a steatite seal. We find a lot of seals in the civilization sites. And unfortunately, the script still hasn't been deciphered. So we don't really know what these seals are saying, but they're quite often um, depicting animals of various kinds and occasionally uh, humans. But there is also this third category where we see animals that are, um, you know, supernatural or maybe it's just creative liberty. And there's a whole range of objects that we recover that also tell us um, about the details of life in the Indus civilization. So whether it's terracotta animal figurines, which are found in the hundreds in a lot of um, different sites, uh, or bone points, which you can see here. You can also see some terracotta beads, um, carnelian beads, uh, some chert flakes over there that were probably used as tools. Um, and lastly, even something like jewelry. So at the bottom, you can see shell bangles over there. Um, that would have clearly been a very important part of someone's everyday uh, life and their routine. Uh, again, a, a number of different things that really tell us about what life was like. So there are copper bangles on the top left that you can see. There's a gold bead, some more carnelian. Um, carnelian beads were a very um, ubiquitous part of uh, Indus Valley life, it appears. Um, we find these carnelian beads from a lot of different sites. Um, and also, for example, pottery that gives us a hint about how it was being used, what kind of um, food perhaps was being prepared. So uh, one of these images is, of course, of um, this perforated pottery type that has been interpreted as perhaps being used as a strainer of some sort. 
Um, and we believe that perhaps these were even used for something like cheese making and were used to strain the liquid um, while making cheese. And so while we have all of these different objects that are recovered from Indus civilization sites, there is a debate about how we can interpret these to understand the nature of Indus life. Um, there are those that believe the public amenities like the great bath at Mohenjo-daro, for example, and the shared access to key resources. So again, for example, um, a shared water reservoir or public toilets, or um, even a centralized food source like the granaries. And finally, the equally sized um, houses and buildings in these sites are believed to be clear evidence of egalitarianism in Indus civilization cities. On the other hand, finds such as the priest king, as well as the goddess figurine, which you can see here, um, and the recovery of expensive materials like gold and copper and precious stones have led others to believe that indeed there were hierarchies and differences within Indus society. So I am hoping that I can convince you that we can use the stable isotope approach to try and tease apart these social differences um, by trying to reconstruct the diets of the individuals living in Indus cities. So within the South Asian context, we find C3 crops such as wheat, barley, uh, rice, oats, potatoes, um, and C4 crops such as foxtail millet or sorghum, um, pineapple, maize. And we can understand the diets of individuals because of these differences between plants as our primary food source. And in terms of nitrogen, the stable nitrogen isotope value gives us an indication of trophic level. Now, unfortunately, in much of South Asia, the preservation conditions are not conducive to um, good preservation. So normally we are not able to get bone collagen. So what I primarily rely on is studying the tooth enamel from individuals and tooth enamel because of its crystalline st structure is much more um, impervious to degradation. So I will be focusing on two sites mainly today, Harappa and Fermana. So both of these are in the civilization cities, but they have key differences. Harappa was one of the largest in the cities, and it is located near the Ravi River in modern day Pakistan. And the Ravi is one of the tributaries of the Indus River. So this is in the key sort of core Indus Valley. And Fermana was a much smaller city, but nevertheless still a city. We have all the hallmarks of that. Um, and it's located in the Gaga River Basin, which is in Northern India. And this is definitely on the northernmost edge of that Indus civilization crescent that you saw on the map earlier. And in terms of the chronology, the sites are roughly contemporaneous. And we know this from radiocarbon dating from both the sites. Um, and here on the map, you can see where the two sites are located. So the next few slides contain um, drawings and images of human remains. So just a warning for that. And if you see a slide with these two icons with the camera crossed out and the Twitter logo crossed out, please do not take photos and um, please do not share them on social media. 
So this is a plan of the Harappa Cemetery. And as you can see, there are numerous individuals in the cemetery and the burials are different in terms of how they're orientated. Um, they're different in terms of how many burial goods the individuals have. And this is the lower level of the Harappa Cemetery. And again, what's clear is that this is a dedicated space for burials. This isn't near where individuals are living. This isn't near where the settlement is. There's a separate dedicated area for the departed. In Fermanagh, it's similar. So this is again, a drawing of the Fermanagh Cemetery. And here, there are lots of different um, orientations of the burials. And again, there are lots of differences in uh, the kind of goods that individuals are buried with. So the number of grave goods, the kinds of grave goods, they really vary. And again, a similarity is that the cemetery at Fermanagh is separate from where the actual city was, where people lived. And this is an example of the kind of um, burial goods that you might find uh, in one of the graves in Fermanagh. So this is one of the richest burials at the site. Um, there were numerous burial um, goods that were, that were interred with the individual. Um, we see these pots that are believed to be part of the funerary ritual. Um, perhaps there was food served in them um, as, as um, the meals for the afterlife. Perhaps they were part of a funerary ritual where um, maybe the loved ones of the deceased had a feast. Um, we don't really know how these pots were used, but we do know that they were clearly able to um, give them to the deceased to take on to their ne next life or or you know wherever they were going um, we also find jewelry so copper items um, again carnelian beads uh, steatite beads um, and then on the other hand we also find burials in Fermanagh that are unusual or out of um, the, the, the ordinary kinds of burials that you find. So one of the individuals at Fermanagh, for example, had no grave goods, um, especially in terms of jewelry or in terms of pottery, but this individual had two bone points um, sort of placed between their legs and that's, that's what they were buried with. So the, there's an idea that maybe this individual was a hunter or somebody who used these tools um, and led a different life uh, compared to the other individuals here. And again, there's an example of an individual who only had two burial pots with them. Um, and maybe this is an indication that they were um, not well off. Uh, they didn't have enough pottery to, to um, take with them to the next life, but we don't know. But one of the ways that these graves are classified at Fermana are as lower status burials versus higher status burials. And the lower status ones are the ones that have a small number of burial goods in them. Um, and now finally, here is the data from the two sites. So the data from Harappa is from a paper by Kenoya et al from 2013. And the Fermana paper, oh, sorry, the Fermana data is um, from my own work. So right away, there are a few things that are clear from this plot. The data set is clearly showing that the individuals at Harappa had a much more restricted diet and all of these individuals were eating similar foods. And if you can make out all the orange um, data points, that really is showing us that at Fermana, there was a much broader range of diets. People were relying on lots of diverse resources. 
And just as a reminder, that little wheat icon indicates the stable carbon isotope values if you're consuming a primarily C3 diet. The small millet icon shows you what values represent a primarily C4 diet. And lastly, that little tree icon is an indication of the kind of, um, the kind of data points that we see when there's an individual who's primarily subsisting off of forest resources. And as you can see, with Fermana, we have the whole range. There is this one individual that appears to be subsisting on forest resources. We have a few individuals that are clearly deriving most of their nutrition from C4 resources like millets. Um, and the vast majority of the individuals are sort of um, either drawing on a mix of C3 and C4 resources or consuming C4 resources and C3 um, plants in the form of wheat and barley, rice, potatoes, tomatoes, all of those things. In this recent paper by Emma Lightfoot and colleagues presents stable carbon isotope data from animals that were recovered from the site of Fermana. And this is clearly showing that there's some animals that have a C4 diet. So they were either being foddered on millet maybe, um, or they were grazing on C4 grasses. And there are other ind individuals, um, other animals from the site who were largely consuming C3 resources. So maybe C3 fodder of some sort, um, or again, grazing. And, and we find both C3 and C4 um, grasses within the vicinity of the site. So what this means is that some of the individuals that are um, sort of a mix between C3 and C4 diets are not only consuming C3 and C4 plants, but they're probably also consuming animals fodded on these C4 plants or C4 grasses. And so we can tease apart that, um, that different sources of uh, contribution towards the diet. And again, this is the stable carbon isotope values from both the sites. And this really clearly shows that Harappa has a much more um, a much smaller range of values. So everybody is eating the same thing. Whereas at Fermana, there's a number of outliers and there's a much broader range. So people are drawing on lots of different resources. This is the same in terms of the stable oxygen isotope data. Um, and the other thing that is apparent from this is that the individuals at Harappa were clearly drawing on um, a more, a drier environment. Whereas at Fermana, some of the individuals were possibly um, getting their water from, from a more wetter environment or at least food resources from a more wetter environment. And we are again seeing an indication of the fact that maybe everybody at Harappa was living a very similar life, but at Fermana, um, which is a smaller city, there were perhaps more individuals that were coming in and out of the city. Um, and maybe they were from the local villages, maybe they were from the local forests, either as, as hunters or um, people who live in forests. Of course, we can't ascertain that, um, but that, that's, that's giving us an indication of what that might have been and why we're seeing this difference in the ranges. And finally, here's a data um, plot to show what Fermana looks like when we point out each data set um, as what the burial goods classified as. So we have Fermana quote unquote low, and these are the burials where individuals had um, no or very uh, or a very low number of 
burial goods in this Vermana High where individuals were buried with a very high number of burial goods. And of course, these are, these are categories that we are creating as archeologists, um, but what is clear when we separate out the data like this is that almost all the Fermana low status individuals appear to be consuming primarily C4 resources. And the Fermana high status individuals on the other hand are much more in line with the Harappa range. So this is primarily C3 resources and you know, that's, that's your wheat, barley, rice, most vegetables, most fruits. Um, and the two outliers that we had, these were also outliers in terms of their burial. So the individual with the lowest value in terms of their carbon isotope ratios was actually the individual that was buried with the bone tools. And their diet certainly indicates that they were subsisting in a forest environment. So perhaps this was a hunter, perhaps this was someone who um, maybe was even an ascetic and lived in the forest and for whatever reason had a connection with Fermana and was eventually buried here. So this data set allows us to draw a number of different conclusions. Um, Individuals from Harappa ate a very uniform diet. And this was primarily based on C3 resources. And this really makes sense when you think about the centralized food storage and the fact that in this area, we know that um, there's a food package almost of wheat, barley, lentils, pea, um, oat, and not really a lot of millet until a much later stage. So all of these individuals in this large city um, are living a very similar lifestyle and almost living a very similar urban lifestyle. It, it means a specific thing. You eat a specific thing if you're a Harappan city dweller. The individuals from Fermana, on the other hand, drew on a diversity of food resources. So we saw that they were consuming C4 resources, um, like millets, they were consuming C3 resources, like lots of different plants, fruits, um, lots of brains, um, lots of legumes. Um, and they also showed a mix between the two diets, which we can interpret as either consuming both of these categories of foods, but also as perhaps consuming animals that were being foddered with C4 plants. There was a range of diets, and so perhaps we can see this as an indication of people from different backgrounds. Um, we are supposed to be what we eat, and it's a good adage because it generally tells us about people's sense of identity, people's sense of how they want to live their lives. Um, and perhaps this is this range of diets at Fermana is also showing us that there isn't as much of a centralized um, food infrastructure that is sort of publicly distributed. So not as structured as, as the mega city of Harappa. And these low status individuals that are in the burials that don't have a large number of burial goods are perhaps not really low status, but rather just a different kind of people. Um, maybe the local or rural people who largely drew on local resources and food traditions. So we know that millet is a local food from this region. So perhaps they're continuing their own food culture rather than um, adopting the ways of the city. And you can do that even while living in the city. 
And finally, even though Fermanagh is the smaller city out of the two, it still appears to be really cosmopolitan. It's part of this network. Um, it's got all the hallmarks of an Indus civilization city, but clearly there are other elements of um, structure and of the social sort of the social constructions of what it means to be urban, what it means to be an Indus city dweller. So I hope you enjoyed that. These are um, all of my collaborators who made this work possible. Um, Professor Vasant Shinde is actually the one who led the excavations at Fermana. Um, and Dr. Patrick Roberts is the head of the stable isotope laboratory that I work in. And of course, this work would not have been possible without the Archaeological Survey of India's permission to um, conduct any sort of research on the Fermana samples. And lastly, all of this research was funded by the Max Planck Society. So a huge thank you to them. Thank you for your time and thank you for listening. I hope you found this interesting. And if you have any questions um, or comments, uh, please get in touch. I would be more than happy to discuss this more.